if, uh, if Jesus would show up at your house, just walk in or knock on the door at least, would you let him in? <clears throat> and uh, so uh, probably he's not going to come in that way, but he is coming again. Amen. And he could come tomorrow. Amen. And he could come today even. What then? <laughs> Amen? Now let me ask you a question this morning. Well, I'll tell you what, first of all, open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Let's just read these couple of verses, and I'm going to ask you a question. Hebrews chapter 4, look at verses 12 and 13 of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. The Bible says, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Let me ask you, the question is, uh, do you love your Bible? You really love your Bible? Uh, I hope you love it more than, uh, there's a couple, two or three uh, people that I've heard about as far as the Bible is concerned. Uh, one, uh, one, one day, this, in this one household, <clears throat> the uh, lady heard somebody outside and so she goes to the window, looks outside, and it's the preacher coming up the walk. <clears throat> she turns around and, and, and tells her, uh, her little girl, uh, she said, put all those magazines away real quick and get out the Bible. <laughs> well, the preacher, they invite him in, and, and she's standing there talking to him. She really wasn't paying that much attention to uh, her daughter uh, behind her. And uh, so she, uh, she told her daughter, she said, hon, uh, she said, while the preacher's here, why don't you go get mommy's favorite book? So she's gone a little bit longer than a mom thinks, and she comes back with a Sears and Roebuck catalog. <laughs> now, another, another one that I heard about, this, this lady, uh, was told the, <laughs> the pastor comes in and, and, uh, and sits down and... and uh, he, uh, he sees the Bible over there laying out. You know, some people have the Bibles laying there on the coffee table and so forth. So he picks that Bible up, and as, she's, as he's picking it up, she says, I just love reading that Bible. Praise the Lord for the Bible. I just love reading that Bible. And he, says, and he notices that as he's, as he's picking it up, that there's a, you know, there's, there's a little space in here. You see, something is there. So he thought she had it marked, a favorite place in the Bible. So he opened up like that. Boom, it's a dirt dauber's nest. <laughs> now, now, let me tell you about one more. And I'm not going to mention the team, the guy's name, or anything about it, but some of you that know some things will know who I'm talking about. It seems this, this, uh, this guy uh, uh, is, uh, is a baseball manager in the minor league system and with, uh, in one, basically one organization. And uh, then he gets, uh, he gets a job, one, the manager of a team, gets fired in the middle of the season, and so this guy gets hired as the interim manager. And so this guy comes on board, and uh, uh, he's, after some things go pretty well, uh, the word gets out that this guy, uh, has, uh, he's been given the job. They're giving him a two-year contract to be the manager of the team. And so someone calls him on the phone and uh, congratulates him on getting his new position. And he said, by the way, he said, he said what, are you, uh, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading a book. He said, well, what book are you reading? He said, the Bible. Now, that word gets back to a lot of Christian people. They think, wow, this is really great. This team has a Christian manager and, uh, you know, just great things going to happen. Maybe, not, you know, I mean, uh, we, at least we'll be proud of our manager. Well, it just so happened that that manager did have some success and uh, his team won the division that they were playing in. And then uh, uh, they had a rookie on the team and uh, the rookie uh, he didn't know that you probably should not be videoing everything that goes on in the clubhouse. And he later apologized, uh, but uh, it went viral. And this manager that had been reading the Bible, uh, he, he starts giving this big speech to his team. And, uh, he's talking about you know, what, everything they're going to do to everybody and, and, all, and all this. And, and uh, 
He used some language that, uh, that really nobody should use, uh, much less a man that's supposed to be reading the Bible. And so somehow, uh, he, uh, I don't know if, if he reads it a lot or if he just <laughs> picks and chooses what he reads, but somehow he missed Ephesians 4.29 that says, let no corrupt communication <laughs> proceed out of your mouth. And so, uh, yeah, you don't, did, how many people guessed who it was? That was the Cardinals manager, Mike Schilt, <laughs> that pulled that off. Well, I don't want to say pulled it off. Anyway, uh, he, uh, apparently he doesn't love the Bible like what we say we do. Amen? You can read it, folks. And remember, uh, in this, in the, going through the book of Hebrews, uh, the, uh, the author uh, is talking about, uh, really, you need to not just uh, uh, listen, but you need to hear, hear the Word of God. There's a lot of people across the world today will, will listen but how many people are really going to hear the Word of God? The Bible is different than any other book, isn't it? I would say it's the book of books. Amen? It is different than any other book that any person could ever read. When you read a, 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 a book that someone else has, has written, uh, no matter who it is and, and what it's about, you could say that man has made that book. Right? He's the author. Man has made that book. But with the Bible, it's the book that makes men and women. Amen? It has an impact. It has an impact on your life and on my life. So I want us to think this morning for a while about how, how is the Bible different? What, what are some things about the Bible that really makes the Bible different? First of all, do you agree that it is different? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Y'all listen now. Don't get too hungry on me, okay? <laughs> so the Bible is, is really Different. Now, the first way it's different, it's, it's different uh, in its inspiration. Here in that, in that 12th verse, it starts off, for the Word of God. It is the Word of God. So it's different in its inspiration. Now, the immediate context in, in, this, in this chapter, back in verse 7, uh, the, the author quotes Psalm 95, and he talks about how God had, ga had given David this 95th Psalm. Well, just like God gave David, that 95th Psalm, folks, he inspired every book in the Bible, every jot, every tittle. It's all inspired by God. Amen? In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, Peter writes, and he says, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know, what's amazing about the Bible, 66 books written by over 35 authors over an approximate period of 1,500 years. That is a miracle. Amen. Amen. It, that is a miracle in itself. And how Now, I know that some of the liberals will say, well, you know, the Bible contradicts itself here and there and so forth. Listen, the Bible does not contradict itself anywhere. Amen. That word inspiration means God breathed. God breathed His Word into these men. And they wrote that Word down as God led them to write it down. His Word is totally, folks, it's in, it is inspired. It's infallible, inerrant. Now, back, uh, I guess back in the 80s, I was part of the, of the group uh, that, uh, let me put it this way. Across the world, there have been some denominations that have, that have given in to liberalism. Amen? I mean, they have just given in to liberalism. And they want to be all-inclusive about everything. And so I was part of the, of the group back in, in the 80s that took a firm stand that the, for the Bible being the inspired, infallible Word of God. Because there was a group that was moving within the, within the convention that were saying that the Bible, it just contains the Word of God. It's not all the Word of God. My question to anyone that would make that statement well, who thinks that they're smart enough, great enough, intelligent enough, spiritual enough to pick out what's true and what's not then? Anybody? There's nobody. It is, I believe it, folks. I believe it from Genesis to maps. Amen. I believe every jot, every tittle. I believe that God has for us everything that we need. It is God inspired. God's word is inspired by him. Now, the second thing that I get here in this, in this verse uh, he said the Word of God is living. Now that word living, and, and uh, I'm reading from New King James. King James says quick, <clears throat> quick and powerful. Well, this, uh, uh, this, word, uh, this word quick means uh, alive. And uh, it's so I, I'd like for us to think for a moment about, 
about how the, the Bible operates, the operation of the Bible. It's different in the way it operates. So the operation of the Bible makes it, uh, makes, uh, it, makes it different. Uh, I think I, I have heard some good motivational speakers, haven't you, over time? Uh, one of the things that kind of breaks my heart, I have known some, some men over the years that were preachers, but something happened, whatever. Something happened in their lives. And so they were not able to be pastors or preachers anymore. And so what they did, in my opinion, they prostituted the gift that God had given them because they just became motivational speakers. You know, I've got to tell you this, folks. And I, I was in, uh, in, in one service. Well, I actually wasn't in the service. I had to do something else. But I was in a service or in a, inside the funeral, if I should put it that way. And one guy that used to be a preacher, he was an evangelist for a while. He pastored churches for a while. Something happened in his life, and, uh, and, he, and he couldn't pastor, couldn't preach anymore. But there was a service. Someone died that they knew him, and they had him to come and do the funeral. And I almost slipped away from other things that I should have been doing. I almost slipped away to go in there and just to see what he had to say. Someone told me that he really didn't preach the word at all. It was just more, more like a motivational speech. Well, I've got to tell you something. I don't, know that I, could, I don't know that I could give a motivational speech apart from the Lord. <laughs> Amen? I don't, know, I don't know how in the world I could really motivate you to do something if you've never been born again. If you don't know Jesus, I don't know how. The Lord is the one that, that His word is, is active. His word is it's powerful. It gives us His inspiration to help us do what He wants us to do. Amen? So, the words, yeah, there's, there's, there's motivational speakers, though. I mean, I heard about one guy uh, one time. Uh, in fact, he used to be a, a coach from that uh, uh, down in Tennessee, and Simo called him years ago, and he was a basketball coach there for a while. And I talked to a guy that was on the committee. He said, well, this guy, he said, you're going to love this coach. He said, this coach is so good. He said, he, he can talk to you. He said, he's got an old, slow, southern drawl. But he said, he can talk to you. <laughs> about five minutes, and he could say, Donnie, jump through that wall. And he said, you'd try your best to get through that wall. You'd scratch, do anything you can to beat that wall down and get through that wall. He said he's a great motivator. Well, folks, a person can maybe be a, a motivator to, motiv to motivate people to do some things, but you, they can't motivate you to do things that, that you can do for God. Amen? Uh, so, his, his, his word and, and its operation here, it's described in, in two ways. Yeah, this, this first way here uh, is uh, it's quick or alive, and that, that word means animate, and which means that the, the word of God is alive. You listening? Say, I'm listening. And it's life-giving. Okay? It is alive, and it is life-giving. And I love this part because it goes back to... Uh, remember when, when Moses was going to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt and he asked God the question, who shall I say sent me? Remember that? What did God tell him? Tell him that I am that I am. <laughs> and it's just like his word. It is always. It's never outdated. God's word is never outdated. It is always current. God said I am that I am, meaning that I was there's never been a time when I wasn't. I am now. There will never be a time when I'm not. Same way with the Word of God. Amen? And so we know that His Word is good for every age. Some people say, ah, you know, those old stories, you know, they, they don't mean anything for today. I'm telling you that whether it's Old Testament, New Testament, it all means something for every day. It'll be, Jesus said, heaven and earth may pass away, but what? But my Word shall not pass away. His Word is going to always be. It is contemporary for every age, folks. Listen. With what we see going on in our world today, there's so many people that's trying to put the Word of God down, trying to put Christians down. But listen, I stand on the Word, don't you? I stand on the Word of God. As long as I stand on the Word of God, I'm not going to fail, right? About what the Bible says, because it doesn't fail. So it, it is alive. It's, it's active. It's, it's, it's powerful. This word powerful comes from the same word in the Greek language that we get our word energized from. What, now, now, be real truthful with me. The first thing that comes to your mind when you think about Energize is what? <laughs> the Energizer Bunny. How we all do, right? 
He doesn't give out either, does he? He just keeps going and going and going, just keeps beating that drum. He has energy. Well, the Word of God gives us energy. It energizes us. Watch this now. It brings life where there's death. It brings activity where there's inactivity. It gives hope when there is no hope. The Word of God gives hope. Amen? Listen. And not just listen here. Hear the Bible give witness to itself. I asked someone the other night in our Wednesday night Bible study about what is the greatest commentary. And pretty much everybody got it right. What is the greatest commentary on the Bible? The Bible itself. Amen? The Bible itself. Listen to some of this. The Bible encourages our hearts. Psalm 119 verse 49 says, Remember the word to your servant upon which you have counseled me to hope. I'm sorry, will you have caused me to hope? Let me read it again. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. You have given me hope. Your word has caused me to have hope. Not to give up, but to have hope. Now, when I think about hope, I think about Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, they're the blessed hope. The Apostle Paul, uh, in his letter to Titus there, talks about the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the hope that I'm really, really looking forward to. Aren't you? I mean, folks, listen, there, there are things that happen day by day. Uh, all of us, from time to time, we walk through the valley, the shadow of death. Uh, we go through storms in life. Amen. They're going to be here until the Lord calls us home. I'm looking forward to the, that blessed hope. I'm looking forward to when the trumpet sounds. Aren't you? It seems like every day I talked to someone just this week and they had just lost a loved one. I'll tell you who it was. In fact, I've, I've got to go to the visitation tonight. There's a lady <clears throat> that, uh, that just passed away that I graduated from high school with, Janet, Janet Summers. I don't know if you've, if you've read her obituary, never married. Janet never married. And she and I served on a committee together, our high school committee now in, uh, in our reunions. And uh, pleasant, very pleasant lady, uh, I, I, a Christian lady. And uh, so I talked to her brother. I, I didn't know that anything had happened. I, I stopped by to, to get something and, and I saw this guy that he was a couple years younger than me in high school. He still is. Just <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm really going back. See, I'm getting younger. <laughs> but uh, he, said, didn't you, he said, you graduated with Janet, didn't you? I said, yeah. And then when he told me, he said, well, he said, uh, she's here. She passed away last night. I mean, you could have knocked me over with a feather. She'd been sick. She'd been str struggling through cancer, but I thought she had done. Last time I saw her, she said she was doing, doing good. And so as I talked there a little bit with the family, I said, isn't it, isn't it something? I said, number one, I said, she's better off than we are. She's with the Lord. That's much better off than we are. Amen? Amen. And I said, and what's so great? I said, we just keep losing people that the Lord just keeps calling home. I said, heaven just keeps getting sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. It gets sweeter. As the days go by, sweeter as the moments fly. <laughs> Amen? So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that, to that blessed hope. So he gives, us, he gives us hope. He encourages our heart. He converts the soul. Psalm 19 talks about the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I consider myself a pretty simple person. Now, don't say amen. <laughs> I'll tell you when to say it. I do this, but <clears throat> no, you can say it. I'm pretty simple. But what I'm amazed at, the more I get into the word of God and his word gets into me, he helps make me wise. Amen. He keeps me from making mistakes that I would have made years ago. He keeps helping me get more wise and more wise as he keeps transforming me to the image of Christ. Also, his word sets us free in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's right. Sets us free, folks, from the power of sin, self, and Satan. Amen? Sets us free. Aren't you glad? Now, it also cleans us up. God's word cleans us up. Do you ever feel like that something's going on in your life and you know that you need... Some you need, to be a, you need a good cleaning? Hmm? God, we don't like to admit that one, do we? 
John chapter 15 and verse 3. Jesus says, Now you are clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. In Psalm, well, let me, let me say this. God's word, yeah, it does clean us up. We go to God's word and he convicts our heart. Whatever needs to be done, we get it right with him. He cleans up our lives. He's the only one that can, right? Amen. Psalm 119, he also guides us. Would you say amen? God, he got, his word guides us. Psalm 119, verses, uh, verse 105 Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You want direction? Read the Bible. You want to know what to do in life? Read the Bible. Amen. God's word cleans us. It, it guides us. Now, also, when I think about how he, how he, uh, how he cleans us, uh, in Sol or John chapter 17, part of, part of Jesus' great intercessory prayer, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Folks, would you agree with me? The power of God's Word just cannot be measured. Amen. You cannot measure the power. The power, it's, it's dynamite, the power in His Word. I don't know if you, if you ever uh, have heard about, read about, the, uh, the true story of mutiny on the bounty. The true story of mutiny on the, uh, on the bounty. Listen to this now. There was, there was nine mutineers, six native men, and 12 Tahitian women. They put ashore at Pitcairn Island in 1790. One sailor, one sailor in that group began, began to distill alcohol. The little colony was plunged into sin because of that. Few people, but they were plunged into, into sin because of that. Listen, watch this. Within 10 years, only one white man survived. Within 10 years. Surrounded by native women and some children that were born during that period of time, during those sinful years. <clears throat> but that one sailor found an old chest. And in that chest, he looked through that chest and he found a Bible. And he took that Bible out and he began reading it, and then began teaching it to others that were there. His own life was changed, but ultimately all the others were changed through the power that's in the Bible. They were discovered, listen now, they were discovered in 1808. Watch this. They had become prosperous, didn't have a jail. <laughs> no jail, no whiskey, no crime. That's pretty cool, amen? Well, how did that happen? Because of the power in God's Word. When it's taught, read, believed, heard, applied, it's got power like nothing else. The Bible is alive and active. Amen? Now, let me mention something else. It's, the Bible is different because of its penetration. Uh, there in that, in that verse 12, it says that it's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of of soul and spirit. So the Word of God penetrates. Now, I've always, whenever I think about the Word of God being like a two-edged sword, one of the things I've always said is like this. When you think about a two-edged sword, in other words, it's got an edge on both sides, it's like it's, it's, it, it penetrates and shows you where the sin is, but at the same time it's showing you where the sin is, showing you that you're a sinner, it's giving you the answers for that. <laughs> Amen? In that way, double-edged double sword. But there's much more. Uh, one is that in the, in the uh, spiritual warfare, the Apostle Paul talks about in, in Ephesians chapter 16, and then in verse 17, it's the only offensive weapon that we have against the devil and his demons. Everything else is defensive, but it is the offensive weapon. That verse says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Throughout the Bible... Listen now, throughout the Bible, the mouth and voice of the Lord are described by a sword. In, in uh, Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 2, a prophecy concerning Jesus, Jesus says that uh, he has made my mouth a sword. <laughs> and then in Revelation, Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 and chapter 2 verse 12 and chapter 19 verse 15, 
Jesus actually has a sword. It's pictured in those verses of having a sword coming out of his mouth. So truly, he has the word of God. Right? Now, these verses though, and I want you to listen closely. I don't want to lose you on this. These verses here, it talks about this two-edged sword and how it divides, how, the, how it actually divides in, in, your, in your life. It's, it, it, in, in verse 12, it talks about uh, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Now, we know this, that we're, we're a, a trichotomy. We're made up. Body, soul, and spirit. Yeah, body, soul, and spirit. Body, that has to do with our physical being. And the soul has to do with our mental capacity. And, of course, the spirit has to do with our, with our spirit life, our spiritual life. Watch. Until a person is saved, the spirit is dead and entombed in his or her soul. Until a, person, until a person is saved, the spirit is dead and entombed in the soul. Watch. In the fall of Adam, remember what God said, if you partake of that fruit, you're going to surely what? And Satan said, oh, you'll not die. And they chose to believe Satan's lies instead of believing God. They did die, folks. Not physically, but let me show you what happened. In the fall of Adam, the spirit of man was separated from God. God could work through that spirit. But once that sin came in, that spirit was entombed in his, in his, in his soul. And the result was death. <clears throat> When the Word of God penetrates our soul, it divides the spirit of man from the tomb of his own soul. When that happens, watch this now, and think about some of these verses right here. And the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And then, of course, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says that we're saved by grace through what? Through faith. So it's through the Word of God. So once that takes place, the Spirit of God, watch, the Spirit of God rules the spirit of man and a takeover of the soul and body become possible because now God can work through that spirit. And that's that part of that sanctification that we're in now and it's the part that, that the Lord is renewing our minds, transforming us to being more like Jesus. That's because that the spirit comes alive. Whenever a person is born again, that spirit becomes alive. Aren't you glad? I'd hate to take that to the bank. Take that. Aren't you really glad? <laughs> Amen, amen, that he, that he has set you free. As a Christian, watch this now, as a Christian, you will never be spiritually mature. Never be spiritually mature until the sword of the Word of God enters your life, cuts away that which does not belong. Amen? amen. There are some things in people's lives that they need to get rid of. The Word of God cuts them away. Amen? When you get into His Word, it cuts them away. Now, the joints and marrow that He talks about here, that's, that's speaking of the external and the internal work of the Word of God in my life and in your life. Last thing. <clears throat> it's also different in its revelation. Different in its revelation. Did you get that? In that it, it, it talks about it in verse 12, and a little bit in verse 13. <clears throat> it said... It, the, word, the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. And then if you look in that, in that verse 13, it says nothing is hidden. There is nothing hidden from God. He knows, your, he knows your mind. He knows your thoughts, folks. He knows what you're thinking. Now, <laughs> wouldn't it be something that, that if all of a sudden, that all of us right here knew what everybody else was thinking? Wouldn't that be something? Now, <clears throat> let me just give you an idea. And I, I'm not accusing anybody of, say, of thinking these thoughts, <clears throat> but it could be. <clears throat> some, or maybe, some may be thinking, well, I hope that food doesn't get cold over there. <laughs> <clears throat> some, some may be thinking, I hope he didn't mean that, what he said about preaching longer so that chicken has a time to get there. We could start without chicken. Some are thinking, hmm, I hope I turned those lights off at home. Uh, there may be some young people that, that, that are here may be thinking about school tomorrow. Think about what you're going to do this afternoon. Some people may think it, be thinking about the job. You know, you, you've seen the cartoon or the cartoons. 
uh, and the, the, the artist drawing these and, and a, a person's thinking something and you see this little cloud above their head that's got those thoughts up there. I, I just wondered I just, how we would all probably die laughing if all of a sudden the Lord would say, okay, I'm just going to show everybody here today what everybody else is thinking. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> that might get a little rough, amen? Now somebody may be sitting there, well, I don't agree with that, I don't agree with this. Don't. I mean, folks, I don't know what you're thinking. But God does. How, we should never think that we can get by with doing something, thinking that we're hiding it from God. It cannot, will not, never will happen. He knows your thoughts. Amen. He knows. You know, it's amazing now. You hear things that, that, that people get in trouble for. Uh, and, and there's one word that I, that I hear quite a bit. They say, well, yeah, but I don't know what the... They, they, don't, they haven't dis, decided yet if there was any intent there. <laughs> I think most of the time, probably somebody does something, there's probably the intent to do something bad with a lot of it, amen? Especially in this stupid political arena that we're in, right? Right? Okay. <laughs> we're not voting or anything. <laughs> okay. God's Word is different in its revelation. God knows our hearts. He knows what we're thinking. God's Word reveals our thoughts. He reveals our thoughts to us. Watch this now. He reveals you to yourself. He knows who you're trying to kid. He knows who you are. And see, he's going to let you know who you are to you. And you know there might be something that needs to be done. Amen? And he reveals himself to you. The only way that we can know God, folks, is he has to reveal himself to us. We don't figure it out. He speaks to our hearts. You trust Him as personal Savior. He comes to live in your life. And life is never the same. But you need to keep in His Word. Stay in His Word. You know, the devil doesn't want people to read the Bible. Amen? He doesn't want you to read the Bible. He doesn't want you to grow any in the Lord. He wants you to get upset about everything. He wants you to get you to the point that you just, I think I'm just going to give up. Let me ask you this question. Does, does any church ever have any disagreements within the church? We're going to have them until the Lord comes back, until the trumpet sounds, we're going to have disagreements. Why? Because we still have a sin nature. And, there, and sometimes, all of a sudden, we want our way instead of God's way. Huh? <clears throat> we learn more about His way when we get into His Word. Is the Bible different than any other book? Stand with me, please. Let me ask you a question this morning. We're going to give God's invitation. What are we going to sing, Bill? 307. 307 is going to be our invitational hymn. <clears throat> but let me ask you. One of these days, the trumpet is going to sound. Jesus is coming back. There's more in the Bible about His next coming than there was about his first coming. We know that he came the first time, don't we? We wouldn't be here if he wouldn't have come the first time. So we know he came the first time. Well, he is coming the second time. Well, yeah, but it's going to be a long, long time before he got. No, 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 no. We don't know that. He could come tomorrow. Yeah. He could come today. He could come while we're still in this service. Many times I've gone into a service, that's the only time that I ever have prayed, Lord, don't come back right now. <laughs> Lord, if it would be your will, let us get through this service and give people another chance. If there's anyone there that's not saved, give them another chance to trust your Savior. Because folks, once he comes back, it's over. It's too late then. The Bible says that he's coming in the twinkling of an eye. Because I'll tell you what some people think. Some people think, well, you know, I know about this when the Lord's coming, and, and so I think that I'll have time to repent, get things right before, no. Have you ever thought about how quick the twinkling of an eye is? What am I doing right now? That's not a twinkle, that's a blink. That's a wink, okay? A twinkle is much quicker than that. A twinkle, if a light hits my eye and you see a little spark, that's how, that's how quick. And he's going to, it's going to all be over. Trumpet's going to sound. Boom, we're out here. Also, 
Some people have the idea, well, I'll tell you what I think I'll do. I, I'm just going to do my own thing, my own way. And, and then uh, if I get sick and I know that I'm going to die, then I'll, you know, I'll give my heart to the Lord just before I die. Well, let me ask you a question. If you're unwilling to give your life to the Lord while you can still live and do things for the Lord, why should He owe you something just right before you die? Hmm? First of all, He doesn't owe us anything. But now, having said that, I'm going to say this. I do believe in deathbed repentance. I really do. I've seen it happen. And usually when it happens, the ones I know about, is the Lord uses that still. Even after the person is gone, the Lord uses that. Did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about... And the Lord uses that. And more people are, are brought into the kingdom because of that. There's only one case in all the Bible of deathbed repentance. And I think it's for two reasons that there's only one. One is that the Lord says, yes, it can happen. That's one reason. That if we have the account. But the other one is, there's only one, so don't count on it. Today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. So today, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, if you, if you don't, if you, right now, if, can you answer the question, if I would die right now, would I go to heaven? If you can't say yes, we're going to give this invitation. You can come and I can help you with your yes. Even if you say, well, I'm not sure, I can, I can help you with that. So in whatever way the Lord would lead you in this invitation, let's just be open and honest to him because he knows your heart. So don't, try, don't think you can fool him. He knows your heart. So let, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing God's invitation. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray today that we'll just be honest with you, each and every one. Lord, I, as I look around, I could say, well, everyone here today may be a Christian. Lord, but only you know that. I don't know that. They do, and you do. Help no one to leave today without any question in their, in their heart and in their mind, whether or not if they die, they're going to heaven, or if the rapture would take place, they'd go be with you. Now, Lord, we pray that during this invitation that we would just trust you and obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. You come as we sing. Some are going to be coming and praying at this altar. If you want to come and do that, you can do that. You need to come to me and talk to me about anything. Please do so as we sing.